Within its sphere of action, the US Navy was probably the most dominant air force of the Second World War. With the Wildcat, then the Hellcat, Corsair and Bearcat, it introduced a succession of carrier-based, piston-engined fighters that were at least the equal of anything that flew off a land base. Their carriers were the best in the world. But the writing was on the wall for the piston engine as a viable propulsion for an air superiority fighter. As early as 1942, it was clear that rapid advances in jet propulsion would likely signal an end to piston dominance within a matter of years. So the US Navy also needed to introduce jet fighters if their aviators were to remain able to access and dominate contested airspace at sea or over land. As ever, designing an aircraft with the same performance as a land-based fighter, but also able to take off and land on a small deck in a heaving sea was a significant challenge. Combining those engineering problems with an unproven and finicky early-stage technology in a short period of time made matters even harder. Taking on this challenge would also launch one of the most successful aircraft companies of the Cold War. The McDonnell Corporation was incorporated at Lambert Field on the 6th of July 1939. It was a latecomer to an industry that already featured some up-and-coming American brands. Curtis Wright and its various predecessors dated back to about 1907. Douglas was founded in 1921, Fairchild in 1924, Lockheed in 1926, North American Aviation in 1928, Grumman in 29, and Republic in 31. Northrop only emerged in its eventual form in 1939, but Jack Northrop had already founded two companies starting again in 1928. McDonnell was therefore a bit part player in the World War II aircraft industry. It produced sub-assemblies for other corporations and assembled a small number of Fairchild AT-21 trainers, but no McDonnell aircraft fought in the war. Even so, the company was able to expand its workforce from around 30 to around 5,000 by the war's end. Despite this success, James McDonnell wanted his company to build its own aircraft. In 1940, he responded to a USAAF requirement for a long-range, high-altitude interceptor to attack enemy bombers. McDonnell's response to this specification was the conceptually advanced XP-67 Moonbat. Although the Moonbat ultimately didn't provide enough performance advantages over conventional aircraft to justify the technical risks, it did enable McDonnell to experiment with advanced aerodynamics and to think about how jet propulsion might be incorporated into aircraft. These were important factors in the Navy's decision to entrust the development of the first naval jet fighter to James McDonnell. But in truth, the main reason was that his business wasn't building any other aircraft. Using them wouldn't distract from the wider war effort. McDonnell was in the right place at the right time. So on New Year's Eve 1942, McDonnell was awarded the contract to build two flying prototypes of the XFD-1 and one static test article. The resultant FH-1 Phantom was a short-lived fighter made in very limited numbers. For that reason, it tends to be covered only as a footnote in the history of jet aviation. I think this is a shame. Without this first step, US naval aviation, and by definition naval aviation in general, would have gone off down a fundamentally different path. And, of course, there would not have been an F-4 Phantom II. Perhaps McDonnell itself would only be a historical curiosity. So we should celebrate the first Phantom. Hopefully this video is a start. The Navy's requirement for the XFD-1 was a defensive fighter intended to fly combat air patrols at 15,000 feet over or near to the carrier. The Navy did not, however, state any desired speed, range or armament. Perhaps this is a reflection of the challenge of making a jet fighter that could land on a carrier in the first place. The engineering team for the XFD-1 was led by Kendall Perkins. Because of the significant uncertainties about the characteristics of jet aircraft, Perkins and his team opted for as conservative a design as possible. The prototype fighter therefore employed a distinctive but conventional wing arrangement. The tail was adapted from the moon bat and featured a marked dihedral to keep it out of the jet blast. 
The nature of that blast was actually one of the biggest decisions the team had to make. Westinghouse essentially presented them with a menu of potential jet engines of various shapes and sizes. Perkins and his team considered some outlandish configurations, such as six engines, three on each wing, and more conventional ones like meteor-style wing pods. They ultimately decided that fairing the engines into the fuselage was the most sensible, both aerodynamically and because it enabled the wings to fold for storage on the carrier. A further benefit was freeing up the fuselage for larger fuel tanks. Given the high fuel consumption of jet engines, this was considered essential. Finally, the wing group filler installation resulted in short inlets and tailpipes, thus limiting thrust loss. Although it looks conventional to our 21st century eyes, the XFD-1 was actually a major departure from piston engine naval fighters. For example, the tricycle landing gear was essentially a mirror image of that on a Corsair or Hellcat. It was possible because there was no propeller needing ground clearance, so the new jet fighter was low to the ground, just 30 inches up. The cockpit was well forward and parallel to the ground, making it much easier for the pilot to taxi. Having no spinning propeller simplified ground handling, although the jet blast could easily knock down an unwary man. The manual contains diagrams that show safe zones. These would become standard for jet aircraft manuals thereafter. Perkins' team finished the prototype in the summer of 1944, but then faced an infuriating wait while Westinghouse built the engines. Only one was available in October, so McDonnell decided to conduct the first runs with just that unit. Even with only a modest 1,165 pounds of thrust on tap, the XFD-1 was able to take off on short hops. One engine flying would become the norm for cruising in the fuel-hungry jet. Inevitably, there were some stability and handling issues with the prototypes. Sadly, this resulted in the death of test pilot Woodward Burke on November 1, 1945, when the aileron failed. But by that point, the Navy had already seen enough to start production. Unfortunately for McDonnell, the initial order for 100 aircraft was trimmed to just 30 due to post-VJ Day cuts. A planned night fighter version was cancelled. Later, this number was bumped back up to 60 units in order to provide enough aircraft for test activities, operational evaluation, and two full squadrons. McDonnell had also done enough to prove themselves that the Navy ordered a prototype for a follow-on aircraft, which would ultimately become the Banshee. They also earned their own manufacturer code. The XFD-1 became the FH-1 Phantom, H being the code for McDonnell. On the 19th of July 1946, Lieutenant Commander James Davidson made the first carrier takeoff and landing by a US jet aircraft. This was on the giant Midway class carrier Franklin D. Roosevelt. Further trials were conducted on the Essex class carrier Kearsage in 1947, then 200 takeoffs and landings on the escort carrier Saipan. The Phantom proved an easy aircraft to fly and operate. The controls were much simpler than those on a piston-engined fighter as there was no need to individually control mix, supercharger and turbocharger settings. One just pushed the throttle backwards and forwards, enjoying a degree of electronic control. This picture shows you just how simple and uncluttered the cockpit was. It must have been a welcome surprise for aviators converting to the new jet. Sadly, the FH-1 was quite underpowered despite the enhanced 1,600-pound thrust engines fitted to the production models. But even so, it flew and landed well on one engine, it could go around if waved off, and had good low-speed handling on approach. Takeoffs took some getting used to as the aircraft's thinner wings took some time flying horizontally before the plane was ready to climb. Even so, it was reliable, took off well with 30 knots over the deck, even on the small Saipan. The carrier's hydraulic catapult could be used if necessary. There was also an aerojet rocket assistance option, which must have been a fun ride. Actually, there's a curious incident with the JATO rocket that's worth telling. In 1948, Master Sergeant Lytton Blass, a Marine Corps pilot, was en route to Roosevelt Roads when his engines failed. Seeing a large sandy beach ahead of him, he executed a textbook belly landing. The Phantom was essentially undamaged and it turned out that the engine issue was just due to fuel contamination. So the Marines dug holes around the landing gear, lowered them and dragged the Phantom up to higher ground. They replaced the damaged flaps and overhauled the fuel system. 
The trouble now was that the sand was soft and there wasn't much space to take off. Using a truck and a crane seemed like the obvious solution, but having discussed it, they realised that this was what the Navy would do, so they thought about things some more and hit upon a much more marine suitable concept. Two JATO rockets were sent for, modified on site, and fitted to the Phantom. Blast climbed back on board, he pushed the throttles to the stops, ignited the rockets, and took off in 320 feet. Then he dropped the rockets and proceeded to his destination. Easy as that. Although it looks dainty, the Phantom was actually a tough little plane. In the round, it proved that jet fighters could operate safely from carriers of all sizes and maintain a high state of operational readiness. There was no ejector seat, so safe handling was a must. Two engines helped with reliability, and other than a mid-air collision on an early cruise, accidents seemed to have been few and far between. Having conducted their early trials on Saipan, VF-171 moved to the Essex-class carrier Philippine Sea. 16 aircraft flew off that carrier for a cruise that put on numerous jet demonstrations for visiting dignitaries. They also rotated pilots through for training. One Phantom was lost on the 24th of August when one Lieutenant Commander Biggers went off the bow and into the sea on takeoff. Fortunately, he was able to escape the sinking aircraft, avoided being run down by the carrier, and was picked up by one of the escorting destroyers. Following this successful operational cruise, in February 1949, VF-171 moved to Midway and then on to Franklin D. Roosevelt. By March, however, the writing was on the wall for the Phantom. VF-171 welcomed three F-2H1 Banshees into its inventory. We have to judge the Phantom's performance in context. It was intended to supplement the Grumman Bearcat as a fleet defender, so that comparison is important. I also think it's worthwhile comparing it to the Army Air Force's P-80 Shooting Star. The Bearcat was an exceptional aircraft, one of the best pistoned engine fighters ever made, and the result of over 40 years of evolution. It isn't really all that inferior to this first production jet fighter. The Phantom is a fair bit faster, about 10%. It can climb slightly higher, but the Bearcat climbs faster, which I wouldn't have expected. Unsurprisingly, the Bearcat has better range. The Phantom's quoted range is, I believe, rather generous, but I've not managed to find a real-world number. Essentially, the Westinghouse engine was about as efficient as the Double Wasp at maximum power, but a lot less efficient at other engine speeds. Armament-wise, both aircraft have 50 caliber machine guns, the Bearcat has 6 in the wings, the Phantom has 4 on the upper nose decking with 350 rounds per gun. The latter made for slightly more accurate shooting, but the muzzle flashes blinded the pilot at night. Some Bearcats were up armed with 20mm cannons, largely because the Big 50 was regarded by the Navy as having too light a shell to deal with modern fighters and bombers. The Navy also wanted all aircraft to be capable of ground attack. The 20mm is better for that too. There simply wasn't space in the Phantom to fit cannons, so it was lightly armed for the day. The superior speed of the Phantom would likely have made it a slightly better point defence interceptor than the Bearcat, Lack of range and the fact that it had limited to no capability as an attack aircraft made it less useful overall. I should say for completeness that the Phantom could carry eight 5-inch rockets for air-to-air -air use. These would look super cool for about two seconds, but the chances of actually hitting anything was pretty much zero. Oh, and as I read the manual I discovered that the guns couldn't be fired when the arrestor hook switch was set down. My assumption is that the idea was to prevent pilots inadvertently firing when the plane set down, but if you know for sure, please leave a comment. To sum up, that the Phantom got reasonably close to the Bearcat was actually quite impressive for McDonald's first go, but you can also see why it wasn't acquired in greater numbers. The Navy was expert in operating propeller-driven aircraft, so the cost to change to the Phantom wasn't worth it. Comparing the Phantom to the Shooting Star shows the sacrifices that McDonnell had to make in order to make the first purpose-built carrier-based jet fighter. The heavier P-80C has 70% more thrust when using water injection. It outperforms the Phantom in all domains except low-speed turning performance. The benefit of the Phantom's design is only really evident in its low landing speed, 80 miles an hour versus 120 miles an hour in the Shooting Star. Comparing the designs, you can see the difference between the slim, long axial flow engines on the Phantom 
versus the bulky but powerful single centrifugal engine that occupies the back of the P-80 and how that influences the design. Most obviously, the P-80 has a much more conventional wing shape and does not need a dihedra on the tail to clear the jet blast. Because the wings don't need to fold, they can incorporate the fuel tanks, which makes up for the fuselage tank space being restricted by the engine installation. Total fuel capacity on the shooting star was 425 gallons internal against 375 for the Phantom. The shooting star also usually carried two 230 gallon tip tanks, bringing the total to 885 gallons. The Phantom could carry a slightly ungainly belly tank with 295 gallons in it, giving a total of 670. Lack of range was a major issue with the Phantom. Its two engines burn more fuel than the Shooting Star's single while also giving less power. Axial flow was the future, it just wasn't as good in this first iteration. There are some other areas in which you can see Lockheed's greater experience in aircraft manufacture. The Shooting Star's guns are low mounted to avoid the muzzle flash issues that the Phantom suffered. The larger fuselage also allowed six guns to be carried. Stronger wings could carry more stores. This is a picture of a P-80 before a mission in Korea carrying 410 gallon napalm tanks as well as the tip tanks. The underpowered Phantom couldn't lift more than a few 5 inch rockets. The P-80 therefore retained some tactical usefulness into the early 1950s. The Phantom was essentially a useful introduction that proved out many of the concepts required to operate a jet fighter off a deck. It only went to sea in waters around the US and was phased out of carrier squadrons into the reserves in 1949. Despite all of the above being true, it is still fun to speculate about what might have happened if things had been different. A simple decision to extend the life of the FH-1 in the fleet by an extra year to bolster jet numbers rather than to ground it isn't beyond the bounds of possibility. And then, on the 25th of June 1950, North Korean forces launch a massive attack into the South. The South Vietnamese forces are swept aside. A small contingent of US Army troops is fighting a valiant retreat down the peninsula. US air assets are rushed to the region. The Kearsage was both available for action and is carrying some of the most experienced aviators in the fleet. Jet conversion focused on the most ready. So two weeks later, the carrier finds itself in the Yellow Sea, flying off as many sorties as it can to provide top cover and close support for the retreating army. A flight of four Phantoms are on patrol, covering a strike by Corsairs. Flying at 10,000 feet in clear skies, the flight leader spots four silvery aircraft diving from high altitude towards them. Calling out a warning, the two elements push their throttles to the stops and climb to engage trying to create a horizontal offset to force the bandits away from the Corsairs. Within seconds, the leader sees that these aren't the LA-9s they've encountered so far. These are something else. MiG-9s. The MiGs are carrying more speed into the engagement. They open fire with their big cannons. The Navy pilots counter with a break into the attack and the formations merge. It is quickly apparent that the Phantom can turn much more tightly and the MiG's lack of thrust doesn't allow it to sustain G for long. Reversing onto the number four in the Chinese formation, the Phantom leader fires a long burst. Fire engulfs the MiG, it tips over and dives towards the ground. The Phantoms pursue north as the Chinese formation attempts to disengage. Another MiG falls to the Phantoms before the MiG's superior speed enables them to escape. The FH-1 pilots return to their carrier, having scored the first jet-on-jet -jet victory in history. My point in making up this scenario is that it's easy to compare the FH-1 to US or British land-based jet fighters, scoff at its modest statistics and assume that it was rubbish. It is, however, worth remembering that the FH was a modest product of the most advanced producer of aircraft in the world at that time. The Soviet Union would go on to produce some fine combat aircraft. The MiG-15 would be a major factor in turning the Korean War back in the communists' favour before it was countered by the legendary F-86 Sabre. But the MiG-9, of which the Chinese had several hundred, was no better than the FH-1, although it was 65 miles an hour faster, in a dogfight the little Phantom had a far lower wing loading and essentially equivalent thrust to weight ratio. The MiG's big cannons were really designed for use against bombers. Their slow rate of fire, slow shell velocity and vicious recoil in the small MiG-9 made them less effective than the 4M3 Brownings for use against fighters. 
and the MiG was every bit as light and fragile as the Phantom, it would have been vulnerable to incendiary machine gun rounds. A Navy Phantom pilot would have had little to fear from any communist fighter deployed in the early months of the war. A MiG-15 would have chewed one up, but that was a later problem. So I believe that the Phantom deserves the benefit of the doubt. Judged in context, it was a neat, elegant little combat aircraft. It didn't set the world alight, but it didn't let anybody down either. It should be more than just a foot.